Hello friends, my name is JJ, and today I thought we would engage in a little speculative futurism. So a few months ago, a young YouTuber named What If Alt Hist did a video entitled How Canada Will Fall, and ever since, a lot of you guys have been asking me to respond to it. Now, What If Alt Hist is actually a friend of mine, and he consulted with me as he was making that video, so I cannot claim to be completely ignorant of it. I agree with some of his analysis, but disagree with other parts. But instead of doing a reaction or rebuttal, I think it might be more useful if I just make my own video on the same topic. So here are three theories on how I think Canada could possibly fall in the next hundred years or so, which is to say, how might the Canada that we all know today vanish over the course of the next several decades? And what might wind up filling this part of the map instead? So by far, the most popular theories of Canadian futurism tend to revolve around scenarios involving the so-called breakup of the country. This is a very common Canadian expression. You tend to hear a lot from politicians and commentators up here. Breakup of the country. It is based on what I would call a sort of keystone theory of how Canada works, which is to say the assumption that all of the provinces are held in place by each other, meaning that if one left, all of the others might scatter too. Keystone theory evokes a certain idea of Canada's 1867 founding, in which the country was built to be a voluntary confederation between four different self-governing British colonies. So the idea is that if one province opted out of this arrangement, the whole underlying premise of the country would be violated, and there would be no reason for any of the other provinces to continue to play along. Canada has expanded dramatically since the founding, with many new provinces having joined, and some have always speculated that as the country has grown larger, the confederation deal has become more unsustainable. That sooner or later, the different identities and interests of Canada's various component parts will come into some sort of irreconcilable conflict, and therefore the country's ultimate destiny is to split up into a bunch of independent nation states. Some go even further and speculate that Canada could even break down into just a few city states given how concentrated Canada's population is getting in just a handful of big urban cores that are very geographically far from one another and don't even trade that much amongst themselves. The problem with this theory, however, is that I don't think there is much hard evidence that Canadians actually conceptualize themselves as citizens of a handful of isolated, mutually exotic communities, as opposed to citizens of a larger nation. A recent poll by the Environics Institute found that the percentage of Canadians who say that they think of themselves as a resident of their province first or exclusively is incredibly small. Outside of Quebec, which is obviously a special case that we will get to later, the only province where over 30% of residents answered yes to this question is Newfoundland, which was a separate country until 1949 which is to say within the lifetime of my father. Everywhere else, the numbers are below 20% and apparently going down. Polls also routinely show that pride in being Canadian is similarly high in every province, which is not exactly the sort of thing that you would expect to see in a place that is supposedly on the brink of being torn apart by regionalism. There is another very popular cliche that feeds into this idea, however, which is this notion that in Canada, the provincial governments are supposedly very powerful. A certain sort of person even likes to go around insisting that Canada is a much more decentralized federation than the United States. Because of course, we insecure Canadians have to beat the United States at absolutely everything, even subsidiarity. But we need look no further than the recent Roe v. Wade ruling to realize why this isn't true. When you hear stories about the possibility of American women going to prison for having miscarriages or whatever, this is only possible because in the American system, the states and federal government share control over the criminal law, whereas in Canada, the criminal law is exclusively controlled by the federal government. And since criminal law tends to be the most moralistic form of law, this has a somewhat homogenizing effect on Canadian political values, in which Ottawa basically just sets a single standard regarding what the country is going to think about abortion or guns or how long murderers go to jail or what drugs are banned and other contentious stuff like that. The majority of the powers of the Canadian provinces are service-based, which is obviously 
nothing to sneeze at in an era where we rely on governments for so much. But at the same time, a lot of provincial budgeting for services is also very tied to funding from the federal government. Take the famous Canadian healthcare system, for example, the single biggest expenditure in any provincial government's budget. Technically, Canada operates under a patchwork system of a bunch of different single payer health insurance plans run by the provinces. But in practice, the federal government covers about a quarter of all provincial health care expenses in exchange for the provinces agreeing to obey various national health care standards. The provinces all like this system and if anything want the federal government to do more, which in turn is one of the reasons why the health care debate in Canada is quite stagnant. The provinces are so dependent on federal funding that they can't really be experimental or creative in how they deliver health care. Since the federal government is able to wield the threat of withholding funding as a way to intimidate the provinces out of doing things that Ottawa doesn't like, such as, say, expanding the role of private insurance or private hospitals. This is broadly the case for other social programs as well, with most provinces getting about 20% of their total revenues for everything from Ottawa, a number that, again, most provinces want increased and has, in fact, mostly been increasing. And this is critical to appreciate because in today's Canada, nationwide government policies have become a big part of what patriotic middle-class Canadians derive their sense of national identity from, be it national gun control, national Medicare, national abortion laws, or anything else. Now, I don't want to imply that Canada's progressive social policies are all universally beloved, because they're not. But at the same time, provincial governments, even the conservative ones, do not tend to challenge them, either because they don't want to for pragmatic reasons, or they just constitutionally cannot. But either way, this lack of local pride and identity, coupled with a lack of a clear set of policy disputes with Ottawa, other than Ottawa is not giving us enough money, has made it hard to form viable provincial separatist movements in Canada, and the polls reflect this. A recent Research Co survey found the province of Alberta having the highest rate of residents saying they strongly or moderately agree that they'd be better off as their own country, but even then it was just 33%. The average rate of support for secession in any province was in the 20s at best. But let us just talk about Alberta specifically for a second because it is the part of Canada that is fast outpacing Quebec as the province that is the subject of the most separatist speculation these days. Alberta is different from the other provinces in that it does seem to have a fairly substantial policy dispute with the federal government, namely oil, which is also something that has become increasingly central to the idea of what it means to be an Albertan. Alberta produces over 80% of Canada's oil, and it's been estimated that as many as as a quarter of all jobs in the province are at least somewhat oil adjacent. But outside of Alberta, fossil fuels are of course increasingly scorned for their role in fostering climate change, and an industry which Canada's national government, especially under the current Prime Minister, has been eager to rein in. The Trudeau administration has introduced all sorts of new, strict, national environmental regulations, and has even mused that in the long term, the Canadian oil industry is something that we will We'll probably have to phase out for the good of the planet. Uh, we can't shut down the oil sands tomorrow. Uh, we need to phase them out. We need to manage the transition off of our dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, that is going to take time. Rhetoric like this has inflamed a lot of conservative Albertans with conflict over Alberta's right to continue harvesting and shipping their oil, often held up as quite literally the fuel of Alberta separatism. But that said, a lot of Alberta's long-term trend lines are also pointing in the other direction. Alberta is becoming a much more urban and liberal province than it used to be, much more or dominated by its big cities, and its traditional grip by the more pro-oil and anti-Ottawa Conservative Party is accordingly starting to loosen a bit. The Albertans elected the more oil-skeptical left-of-center NDP party to power for the first time in 2015, and they may soon elect them again. As well, independent of climate change concerns, Albertan oil, which now mostly comes from the so-called tar sands, is also some of the most expensive oil in the world to extract, which makes the provincial government very dependent on the volatile price of oil remaining high. So there are arguments that this just isn't a 
a very good long-term economic model for the province as well. In any case, even though 30% of Albertans may claim to support it, Alberta separatism doesn't really exist as even an embryonic political movement. For decades now, efforts at creating a separatist political party have flopped to the point where even parties considered to be separatist, like the Maverick Party, have to water down their language about how they're actually just trying to get greater fairness in the Canadian system or whatever, and they still flop. Basically, for separatism to be viable as a political agenda, you need some sort of infrastructure to support it. Separatist parties, separatist leaders, separatist separatist media, separatist intellectuals, and so on. And none of this exists in Alberta, let alone the other provinces, which is why I am always skeptical when commentators treat the breakup of Canada as something that is so obviously going to happen sooner rather than later. But, of course, there is one big exception to this, and that is Quebec. There has been a lot of talk recently about the virtues of playing the so-called long game in politics, and how the biggest victories come to the patient. And when it comes to Canadian separatist movements, no one has been playing a longer game than the French-Canadian nationalists in Quebec. In the old days, people thought that Quebec's breakup with Canada would come in a single, sharp, decisive moment, like a referendum on separatism followed by a unilateral declaration of independence. And to be sure, those tactics have been tried, but it is now looking like Quebec nationalists have been far more successful at just gradually edging their province out of the Canadian system to the point where they are already getting pretty close to being a separate country in all but name. Since the modern political rise of Quebec nationalism in the 1970s, successive Quebec governments have gradually entrenched French as the province's sole acceptable language of government and business. They've obtained control over traditional federal powers like tax collection, social security, and immigration, and basically just sought to enshrine in as many places as possible this idea that they are the special province that gets to play by a different set of rules than the others. Things have only accelerated under the super-nationalist government of current Quebec Premier Francois Legault, who recently cajoled the federal government into approving a constitutional amendment to declare Quebec the nation of the French-Canadian people. This sort of thing would have been considered a huge affront to the Canadian order 20 years ago, but today the country has been successfully conditioned to accept it as inevitable because of the way the temperature has just been slowly turned up over the decades. It is now hard to imagine any future Quebec government putting any of this stuff into reverse, or any future Ottawa administration daring to try to put this toothpaste back in the tube. My assumption would be that in future decades, we will continue to see Quebec play the incrementalist game with subsequent administrations acquiring the remaining symbols of sovereignty, including their own passports, currency, Olympic team, maybe even an independent armed forces. Whether this all culminates in Quebec eventually cutting the final cord and becoming an independent country, or whether the nation of Quebec is content being part of some sort of Kurdistan-esque autonomous zone within Canada seems kind of irrelevant. The point is, this seems destined to be a corner of the map where the Canadian government is going to exercise progressively less and less authority over anything, other than signing the checks, of course. But if we get back to the thesis of this video, does the departure of Quebec mean the end of Canada? If you buy into the most narrow version of the Keystone Theory, which posits that this country is fundamentally a cooperation deal between the French and English Canadians, then any opt-out by Quebec obviously means the collapse of that dream. But I honestly think that to most Canadians, Quebec is becoming an increasingly ignored, out-of-mind place, meaning that even if Quebec did leave, I really can't imagine it would have much impact on what people in the other provinces thought about their own status in Canada one way or another. The only other form of separatism in Canada I think has some genuine momentum would be indigenous separatism. I talked about this a bit in my award-winning video, Canada Has Failed, but for a number of reasons in recent years, the Canadian government has become much more enthusiastic about the idea of maximizing the autonomy of Canadian Indian bands, adopting what Prime Minister Trudeau has often called a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. His government likewise recently passed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is basically the most explicit acknowledgement in Canadian law to date that Aboriginal Canadians are a people with rights and powers that exist completely independently 
of the Canadian state. Canada has had Indian treaties and Indian reserves for a long time, but under the changing mindset of Ottawa and this new UN DRIP framework, there has become much more interest in basically revisiting all of the attitudes and institutions that have defined Canadian Indigenous relations up until now. This is sometimes described as the agenda of decolonization and reconciliation, but it can be pretty ambiguous what the end goal of it all is. Obviously, the original sin of Canada was Europeans stealing land from the natives, but so much has happened in the centuries since that this isn't really a cake that can be unbaked. Despite the slogans of some activists, the land is obviously never going to be given back in total. But that said, you could imagine a future scenario in which the various indigenous nations are permitted to exert more control over Canada in a sort of landlord type way, exercising more oversight and veto power over what is done on their traditional lands, which of course is basically the entire country. The Canadian judicial system has gradually been establishing an indigenous power of consultation and veto as constitutional rights in the Canadian system, and I would assume that if we extrapolate several decades or so into the future, you could imagine indigenous rights to have grown so expansive that the First Nations are basically co-governing the country in some way. Prime Minister Trudeau's administration has recently begun efforts to create something known as a Reconciliation Council, which is basically a body of indigenous Canadian leaders to supervise the federal government's decolonization agenda. I think you could envision something like this eventually morphing into some sort of co-governing body that could conceivably even supersede the powers of the Ottawa government in various important ways. Now, could Canada survive this form of indigenous nationalism? I think there are certainly people on the far left who would like to see the Canadian settler state completely broken down and replaced with some sort of post-colonial indigenous-led society. But more realistically, I think you could also imagine some sort of post-apartheid South Africa type situation where the state survives but with a completely different sense of purpose and identity at its core. So I don't really buy into the idea that all democracies inevitably fall into dictatorship, but it certainly seems possible that at some point the dominant values of Canadian politics could shift in some dramatic way that basically puts a halt to the slow growth of liberal democracy that has defined our previous centuries. If Canada ever became some sort of authoritarian state, the country would still survive in a literal sense, but it would have also strayed so far from its founding purpose, it would have also died in some very critical way. One possible scenario for this outcome that I discussed in a recent column for the Washington Post was that the United States becomes a dictatorship first and Canada then swiftly becomes a dictatorship in response as well. I know that this is quite counter to the way that a lot of Canadians would like to imagine this sort of thing would go down. You look at a work of Canadian fiction like The Handmaid's Tale and Canada is presented in this very flattering way as the part of the continent that stays free after America falls to tyranny and even provides a refuge for fleeing Americans. In practice though, I think if America ever did collapse into some sort of fascist regime, Canada's elite, who tend to be pretty anti-American at the best of times, would probably feel incredibly vindicated and cocky and use the fall of America as a pretext to implement a bunch of regressive policies to lock in their own rule. In other words, if there was no more United States, a future Canadian government would probably feel more enabled to ban freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and restrict the media and end free and fair elections because these would all be seen as dumb and discredited American ideas that even America itself clearly did not believe in. It would be kind of like what happened in the 1940s in France after they failed to fend off a German invasion. The French political establishment just kind of concluded that democracy was no longer the pony to bet on and established their own fascist dictatorship to defend what was left of their sovereignty. You could imagine some future Canadian government making a similar argument that a collapsed and possibly hostile America necessitates the need for Canada to become a dictatorship leadership too, to defend our independence and negotiate with the new American regime on a strong footing and so on. But even independent of this wild scenario, my guess would be that Canada of the future is probably on track to be less, not 
more free. And that anti-American nationalism will probably play a large role in that. I just think that the supposed need to protect Canada from American influences and American problems and even American ideas has traditionally proven itself to be a pretty flexible justification that can be used to rationalize a lot of bad ideas. And assuming nationalism remains strong across this country, or even grows, I think it is a fair bet to believe we will continue to see nationalism evoked as a pretext to restrain what Canadians can see, hear, say, or even vote for. But what if things go the exact opposite way? Why, then we would be in scenario three. So from the earliest days, elites in Canada have worked hard to discourage Canadians from wanting to join up with the more rich and powerful United States, usually by portraying the United States as a wicked and repulsive place that ordinary Canadians should hate and fear. The exact reasons we are supposed to hate and fear America have changed a lot over the centuries, noticeably shifting from right to left, as I discussed in my award-winning video on Canadian nationalism. Today's Canadian nationalism is very much bound up in a kind of progressive populist rhetoric that, as we talked about earlier, is very tied to things like public health care and gun control and abortion rights and other stuff that resonates with members of this country's secular and often quite nervous suburban middle class. This is a class of people who care a lot about affordability and safety and are thus highly susceptible to portrayals of America as a very dangerous, expensive place that threatens middle class dreams. But you know, even the strongest nationalism can break down over time if the context in which it originally arose ceases to exist. For Canada to end its experiment with nationalism and just join up with the US already, I think a few things would have to happen along the way. One would be that people would just have to start talking about the idea more in an open sort of way. Right now, the idea of having Canada join the US is this very, very taboo topic in Canada because it is seen as being incredibly unpatriotic, even though polls suggest it is not nearly as fringe of a belief as, say, voting for the Green Party. A lot of nationalism is based on stereotyping the other, and I do think that a lot of Canadian stereotypes of America and Americans are harder to sustain at a time when the technologies of the modern world have made it easier for Canadians to know Americans and visit America than ever before. Second, for union to happen, I do think that the United States would have to be seen as less threatening to the Canadian middle class. This isn't that hard to imagine, though it does depend a lot on the political trajectory of both nations. If Canada went through a significant phase of reformist conservative rule, and the US went through an equally reformist phase of progressive rule, I think it is easy to imagine the social policies of both countries meeting somewhere in the middle. Again, we are talking about like decades in the future, not just like an election or two from now. But by like the year 2080 or so, it doesn't strike me as that unlikely that there could be a lot more cross-border consensus on issues like healthcare or gun control than there is today. And the third condition is that both countries would have to see a union as being in their clear material benefit. The Canadian journalist Diane Francis wrote a rare book in 2013 advocating a merger of Canada and the US, largely on economic terms, and largely because she said that this would be a way that Canada could help the US maintain its superpower status in the context of a world facing the growing threat of a rising China. She is somewhat sympathetic to the idea of a more planned economy, so she was very into the prospect of a single state exercising consolidated control over North America as a better way to manage the wealth and interests of this continent, as opposed to what we are doing now with our current system of endlessly overlapping and redundant agencies and laws and regulations and so forth. If the US, and especially Canada, were to experience a very prolonged period of sluggish economic growth, you could see the case for a US-Canada merger seeming increasingly attractive to leaders on both sides, just as the previously taboo idea of free trade with America became increasingly attractive in the late 1970s and early 1980s in Canada, when the economy seemed to be in a similar downturn. When you look at some of the great bursts of prolonged economic growth in the past, in both Canada and the US, 
They tend to correlate with significant paradigm shifts. Women entering the workforce, for instance, or World War II. East Germany experienced a big boost in growth when it merged with West Germany, as did many of the poorer nations of Europe after they joined the EU. So in a dire enough economic environment, the Canadian provinces becoming states of the US could wind up looking like a fairly rational thing to future generations. But only if the future also winds up being an era less nationalistic than our own. So yeah, I feel like we covered a lot of ground in this video. Obviously, all predictions about the future tend to be horribly myopic, backed by little evidence beyond wildly extrapolating from the present, and mine are no different. As any student of history knows, the timeline of humanity is much more wild and fluid than we give it credit for, and shocks can emerge when we least expect them. So I would be curious to hear some of your predictions about the long-term future of Canada, how the country as we know it today might end, and especially what sort of big changes you think might happen that no one sees coming today. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next week.